नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू सनसेट टेलीविजन आई एम विशाल दहिया एंड यू वाचिंग द न्यूज लेट्स बिगिन विद द हेडलाइंस फर्स्ट इंडिया पॉलिसी ऑन यूक्रेन स्टेट फास्ट एंड कंसिस्टेंट एसर्ट्स एस जयशंकर इन राज्यसभा एम्फेसाइज डायलॉग एंड डिप्लोमेसी टू रिजॉल्व यूक्रेन क्राइसिस India has emerged as the strongest investment destination in the world says Piyush Goyal in Lok Sabha Rajya Sabha takes up discussion on demand for grants of the Ministry of Railways Birbhum violence post mortem report show victims badly beaten before being burnt governor calls it horrific Mamta Banerjee meets families of victims Supreme Court allows center to investigate fake claims in covid cases says government could verify only 5% claims in four states with high suspected fake claims and nato countries hold emergency meeting on ukraine russia conflict us president joe biden arrives in brussels and before we move ahead a quick look at some other news as well President Ramnath Kovind addresses Gujarat Legislative Assembly emphasizes role of people's representatives in democracy PM Modi hails gem platform for achieving orders worth 1 lakh crore rupees in a year BJP Legislative Party meets in Lucknow elects Yogi Adityanath as its leader in Uttar Pradesh Polling for urban local bodies gets underway in Odisha. Six thousand four hundred candidates in the fray. Foreign Secretary Harsh Vardhan Shringla meets UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, discusses situation in Ukraine, Afghanistan, and Myanmar. Private bus operators go on indefinite strike in Kerala, demanding hike in fares. Health Minister Mansukh Mandavia reiterates India's resolve to become tuberculosis free by 2025. Income Tax Department issues tax refunds worth 1.93 lakh crore rupees to 2.26 crore taxpayers till 20th March. Air show Wings India 2022 takes off at Begumpet Airport in Hyderabad. Ravindra Jadeja reclaims number 1 spot in ICC men's test rankings for all-rounders. Let's now take a look at some news from the parliament. India's position on the Ukraine conflict has been steadfast and consistent. External Affairs Minister S J Shankar said in reply to a question in the rajya sabha on thursday jay shankar said india has been seeking immediate cessation of violence and calling for ending the crisis through talks he added that india has been emphasizing that global order is anchored on international law the un charter and respect for territorial integrity and sovereignty of states india's position on ukraine reflects this reasoning indian foreign policy decisions are made in indian national interest and we are guided by our thinking our views our interests so there is no question of linking the ukraine situation to issues of trade uh, where our own position on ukraine is concerned it is very clear sir our belief that the international order must respect the territorial integrity and sovereignty of states The Lok Sabha speaker applied the gillotin to pass demand for grants and appropriation bills relating to various ministries and financial year 2022-23. Now earlier the house discussed demand for grants relating to the commerce ministry, ministry of ports, shipping and waterways. Commerce minister Piyush Goyal said in the last 7 years a transparent system, result oriented administration and innovative funding have helped India emerge as a strong global economic and investment destination. he said post 2014 fundamental reforms have been rolled out in all areas puri duniya ke nivashak bharat mein aana chahte hain yahi to karan hai ki 7 varsho tak lagatar har varsh pichle record tod ke adhik foreign direct investment bharat mein aaya hai covid jaise gambhir samay mein bhi 
हमें कभी विदेशी मुद्रा की तंगी नहीं आई ना निवेश की तंगी आई क्योंकि आज विश्व को भारत में एक मजबूत और विश्व में सबसे तेज गति से बढ़ती हुई अर्थव्यवस्था दिखती है All five Aam Aadmi Party candidates have been elected unopposed to Rajya Sabha from Punjab. Former cricketer Harbhajan Singh, party leader Raghav Chadha, founder of lovely professional university Ashok Mittal, IIT Delhi professor Sandeep Pathak and industrialist Sanjeev Arora have all been elected Rajya Sabha members. No other political party fielded candidates from Punjab. Today was the last day withdrawal of nominations for Rajya Sabha elections for 13 seats in 6 states. In Nagaland, P. Konyek of the BJP was elected unopposed to Rajya Sabha from the state. The National Human Rights Commission on Thursday issued notice to the West Bengal government and the state police chief in connection with the killing of eight people in the Bogoi village of Birbhum district on Monday. The Human Rights Commission has sought a report within 4 weeks on the police steps to ensure the safety of the people. A Trinamool Congress delegation met Union Home Minister and Amit Shah to seek the removal of Gov Governor Jagdeep Thankar, Derek O'Brien, Mohia Mahua Moitra, Sudeep Bandopadhyay and others were part of this delegation. West Bengal governor meanwhile uh, has termed the Birbhum violence case shameful and a blot on governance he said burning people alive like this is very painful in a democracy the state chief minister mamta banerjee met families of those killed in the birbhum district violence she blamed administrative negligence in the matter and said the police should have been alert after the murder of the tmc leader she also announced assistance of 5 lakh rupees to the next of kin of the dead and 1 lakh rupees to those whose houses were burnt Meanwhile postmortem reports showed that eight people including three women and two children were brutally beaten before being burnt alive in Bogi village an SIT team is investigating the incident Yogi Adityanath was unanimously elected leader of the legislature party of BJP in Uttar Pradesh he will take oath as chief minister for the second time in a row the legislature party met in the presence of union home minister amit shah and former jharkhand chief minister raghuvar das adityanath's name was proposed by suresh kumar khanna the senior most member of the bjp's legislature party to which all the mlas agreed the ruling bjp has 255 seats in the assembly its ally apna dal has 12 and the nishad party has 6 seats The cabinet will be sworn in on Friday in Lucknow in the presence of Prime Minister Modi, several union ministers, senior BJP leaders and prominent personalities from various fields. Uttar Pradesh Vidhan Sabha ka ek naya itihas likhne ka kshan isi sabhagar ke andar ho raha hai. 35 saalon se kabhi bhi एक पार्टी को दूसरी बार पूर्ण बहुमत नहीं मिला है भारतीय जनता पार्टी अकेली एक ऐसी पार्टी है जिसने दोनों बार दो तिहाई से ज्यादा बहुमत के साथ जनता का समर्थन हासिल किया सुप्रीम कोर्ट हैज अलाउड द सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट टू इन्वेस्टिगेट फेक क्लेम्स फॉर कोविड 19 कॉम्पनसेशन नाउ द बेंच सेड दैट द गवर्नमेंट कुड ओनली verify 5% in four states maharashtra kerala gujarat and andhra pradesh where there was a significant difference between the number of claims and the number of deaths the top court had allowed 60 days for those eligible to apply for ex gratia compensation and 90 days for such applications in future punjab chief minister bhagwant man today met prime minister modi Man reportedly sought a package of 50000 crore rupees for 2 years to improve the financial condition of the state. Kerala Chief Minister Pinarayi Vijayan also called on Prime Minister Modi in Delhi. The meeting comes in the backdrop of opposition protests over Silver Line, the ambitious semi high speed rail project of Kerala government. Kerala is awaiting the center's approval for this project. The budget session of Delhi Assembly saw disruptions for the second day on Thursday. BJP and Aam Aadmi Party MLAs exchanged words over the installation of a high mass tricolor at a park. Two BJP MLAs were escorted out of the house by the marshals. 
The Maharashtra Assembly passed a bill to set up special courts to ensure speedy trials of crimes against women and children. It also approved a bill to make Marathi mandatory for official work of local authorities. Chief Minister N. Ranga Swamy will present the interim budget for the Union Territory of Puducherry. The Speaker said the House will meet on 30th of March for the interim vote on account presentation. Amadmi Party leader Raghav Chadda resigned as MLA from Delhi's Rajinthanagar Assembly constituency. The party has nominated him as its Rajya Sabha MP from Punjab. Three MLAs of Vikas Insan Party, including State Minister Mukesh Sahani, joined the BJP in Bihar. Sahani said he will not resign from the post of minister. His term in the Bihar Legislative Council ends in July this year. Voting was held for 109 urban local bodies, including Bhubaneswar, Katak and Parhampur Municipal Corporation in Odisha, amid tight security. People braved the scorching sun to cast their votes. Counting will take place on 26th of March. The Supreme Court refused urgent hearing on petitions challenging the Karnataka High Court's decision in the hijab case. The court also told the pro-hijab lawyers to avoid sensationalizing the matter. And time now for some news from the business and economy sector. The International Monetary Fund expects global growth will slow in 2022 but remain positive despite lingering effects of the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. The new IMF projections will be released in April's World Economic Outlook report during the IMF World Bank spring meetings. The IMF feels global economic activity could end up being a third of what it was before the Ukraine war. It also estimates that while direct financial exposures to Russian sovereign debt are manageable, ongoing events increase the probability of a risk-off episode that could pressure emerging markets. In terms of what the impact would be if there were a default, I think the direct effect uh, on the rest of the world would be quite limited because the, the numbers that we're looking at are relatively small from a global perspective. It is not a systemic risk to the global economy. However, you can, of course, have some banks that have greater exposure to these particular assets that could be negatively impacted. And of course, from Russia's perspective, it will have consequences for its long-term uh, you know, when you've defaulted, re-entry into the market is not that easy and that can take a long time. Assessing the impact of the war and the sanctions on Russia in different parts of the world in different categories of countries, the IMF says that for many emerging markets, tightening of financial conditions could be a big shock. Bureau Report, Sensor TV. The Asian stock markets were mostly subdued on Thursday. The constant rise in crude oil prices and statements from the US Fed were not very encouraging for investors. Moreover, they hold their investments and kept an eye on Brussels, where NATO's summit is on that reflected in the closing of major indices. Only Straits Time of Singapore gained 1%. Nikkei 225 could only rise up to 0.25%, whereas Hang Chang was down less than a percent at 21,946 levels. And Kospi also remained more or less flat and ended the day with minor loss of 0.2%. Taking a cue from their Asian counterparts, Indian stock markets also headed south on second consecutive day. The selling was seen in banking, auto and FMCG stocks. According to experts, the markets now lack direction and is moving up or down on a daily basis, responding to news regarding crude prices, FBI flows and speculation on what uh, the Fed might do in the coming policy meets as well. However, today the 30 share BSC Sensex lost 80 Nine points and closed at 57,596. On the other hand, National Stock Exchange's Nifty 50 ended the trade at 17,223 points, which is down 23 points from its previous closing. We'll take a short break here, but coming after the break, uh, how development of groundwater access can help alleviate water scarcity in drought-prone regions. Why does diplomacy matter? And how does it impact the common man? How did this happen? And what can be done? 
to repair this important relationship. What is new in our foreign policy? Welcome back. Let's uh, begin the second half of the news with uh, some important items from Russia-Ukraine conflict. Ukraine's President Zelensky has asked for air support from NATO, addressing the group's meeting at Brussels via video link. Zelensky said that he has been asking for air support to help shield our sky from the very beginning, as Ukraine has no powerful anti-aircraft defences. However, NATO has clarified that making Ukraine a no-fly zone is not an option. It's the gathering of the mighty NATO in Brussels. The agenda would be to put pressure on Russia. The group will also have to take into account the mounting cost of war that allies are bearing in terms of aid to Ukraine and refugees. Prior to the meeting, President Zelensky in a message said he expects serious steps from NATO, the European Union and the G7. However, NATO has categorically ruled out any direct participation in the conflict. Uh, declare uh, a no-fly zone over Ukraine uh, means that we need to impose it. And to impose a no-fly zone means that we need to uh, massively attack uh, Russian air defense systems uh, in Russia, in, in Belarus and in Ukraine. And also be ready to shoot down Russian planes. And uh, then the risk for a full-fledged war between NATO and Russia will be very high. And that will cause more death and more destruction. Although the Russians are claiming big success in their operation, it is also true that they are facing tough challenges from Ukrainian forces. The fear of a chemical war is also looming large. Western countries have accused Russia of spreading lies about chemical laboratories in Ukraine to find an excuse to use chemical weapons. I will not speculate uh, beyond uh, saying the following, that any use of chemical weapons would fundamentally change the nature of the conflict. It will be a blatant uh, violation of international law and uh, it will have uh, uh, widespread and severe uh, consequences. However, Russia is still supplying gas to European countries. Any disruption in Russian supply will directly hit their economy. President Putin has committed to honour his oil and gas commitments. So at the end of the day, will it be an exercise to keep business as usual or will NATO take a decisive action to help Ukraine? Yes, that. Bureau Report, Sunset TV. Let's now take a look at some more important news from across the world. China's foreign minister made a surprise stop in Kabul to meet Afghanistan's Taliban rulers on Thursday. The meeting will feature discussions on issues including the extension of political relations, economic and transit cooperation. The Taliban are seeking international recognition to open up their economy. China has not recognized the Taliban government yet, but it has also avoided criticizing the new rulers despite its failure to honor promises on reopening schools for girls above sixth grade. Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida told reporters Thursday that a North Korean ballistic missile landed off the western coast of Hokkaido near Japanese territorial waters. Officials uh, con corrected the estimated landing location from off Aomori to Hokkaido. Kishida called it an act of unforgivable recklessness. He was in Belgium to attend the summit of NATO and other group of seven leaders. Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari inaugurated a $2.5 billion fertilizer plant with which Africa's most populous country hopes to contribute to the global supply amid the impact of increasing prices in the aftermath of Russia-Ukraine war. The Dengote fertilizer plant in the uh, commercial capital of uh, Lagos is uh, expected to boost agriculture output which contributed as much as 25.8% to the economy in 2021. Foreign media were given access to the efforts to search for clues into the China Eastern passenger jet crash earlier this week. Off and on rain impeded the search for a second straight day as investigators expanded their search for a second black box from the aircraft that had 132 people on board. Hundreds of officials, including police officers, paramilitary police, 
and construction workers were seen on site. Madeleine Albright, who became the first female U.S. Secretary of State, died at the age of 84 in Kosovo. Prime Minister Elbin Kote paid tribute to Albright, saying that his country will always be thankful to her for NATO's intervention to stop the Serbian genocide in the spring of 1999. Kosovo was a province of Serbia and came under UN and NATO administration after a 1999 NATO-led air war halted a Serbian crackdown on ethnic Albanian separatists. And time now for some news from the world of science and technology. In countries like Kenya, climate change is pushing conventional water sources to the brink of exhaustion. Unpredictable weather patterns and low rainfall means surface dams are no longer a reliable source of domestic water. A new UN report highlights how development of groundwater access can help alleviate water scarcity in drought-prone regions. In remote villages of Kenya, people have to walk three kilometers in search of water. This drilling rig is expected to access groundwater 3,000 meters below the surface. A solar-powered pump will allow the local villagers free use of the water. The project is in line with the solutions to water scarcity, suggested in a new report by the UN World Water Development. Asking the question, is the solution to water crisis hiding right under our feet? The report says, Groundwater is not only safe but affordable, but it also doesn't need expensive and sophisticated water treatment plants. The report says that regions like Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East hold substantial quantities of non-renewable groundwater supplies that can be extracted in order to maintain water security. It concludes that the low use of renewable groundwater is due to a lack of investment in infrastructure and a lack of professional knowledge of the resource. These findings are valuable for regions where rains are scanty and the dams are drying. The UN report argues that development of groundwater can irrigate more land and improve agricultural yields and crop diversity to drive forward economic growth. Bureau report. Sansa TV. Moderna is asking regulators in the United States and Europe to authorize two small doses or shots for youngsters under the age of six. The company is also seeking larger dose shots cleared for older children and teens in the United States. 18 million children under five are the only age group not yet eligible for vaccination. Pfizer currently offered kid-sized doses for school-aged children and full-strength shots for 12-year-old and older. Moderna said a quarter of the dose it uses for adults worked well. For youngsters under age of six, Moderna said it has enrolled about 6,900 children in a study of the 25 microgram doses. Early data showed after two shots, youngsters developed virus-fighting antibody levels just as strong as young adults getting regular strength shots. Now, moving ahead, uh, the company, uh, we were talking about Moderna and uh, the 18 million children under five, the age of five as to how Moderna is going to go ahead and give shots to them. Let's move on to some other news items here and uh, from the world of astronomy. Now, astronauts on Wednesday worked to install uh, hoses on a wall module, a power and a data cable and replace an external camera during a spacewalk at the International Space Station. Expedition 66 flight engineers of NASA and ESA European Space Agency began the spacewalk to install houses, hoses on a radiator wall to support temperature regulation. Time now for some news from the world of sports.
And let's begin with cricket. After leading IPL franchisee Chennai Super Kings in 12 seasons with four titles and five runner-up finishes, MS Dhoni has quit as its speaker just two days before IPL 2022 starts on Saturday. Captain Cool will, however, represent the franchisee for the season and beyond. As officially mentioned by CSK, Dhoni has handed over the reins of the side to Ravindra Jadeja. Defending champions England registered their third consecutive win in the Women's World Cup in New Zealand. The resurgent English side scored a nine-wicket victory over Pakistan in Christchurch. Batting first, Pakistan folded for 105 all-out inside 42 overs. England reached the target for the loss of just one wicket with 30 overs and four balls to spare. Catherine Byrne, the veteran England seamer who had taken just one wicket from five matches along with Sophie, completely demolished Pakistan's Batting side taking three wickets each. Danny Voigt scored an unbeaten 76 of 68 balls to bring it home for England. South Africa have qualified for the Women's World Cup semi-finals after rain washed out their match against West Indies in Wellington. Only 10.5 overs were possible after South Africa got in trouble at 61 for four in a rain-reduced match. But persistent rain prevented further play. West Indies' hopes of advancing are hanging by a thread after... Three losses, three wins and a no result. The no result in Wellington puts India in a more difficult situation to qualify for the semi-final. India is now at fifth place in the points table. India needs to win against South Africa to make it to the last four. The other contender, England, have now a better net run rate than India and a relatively easier opponent in Bangladesh for their last match. If either India or England loses... West Indies will advance to the knockouts. New Zealand can make it only if both India and England lose and they win against Pakistan. Australia have set Pakistan a target of 351 runs to win the Lahore Test. Australia declared their second innings at 227 for three wickets with Pakistan-born opener Usman Khwaja uh, remaining not out at 104. David Warner scored 51. Pakistan was 73 for no loss on day four reading 278 runs on their final day. And before we bring this bulletin to an end, let's look at the headlines once again. India's policy on Ukraine steadfast and consistent, asserts S.J. Shankar in Rajya Sabha, emphasizes dialogue and diplomacy to resolve Ukraine crisis. India has emerged as the strongest investment destination in the world, says Piyush Goyal in Lok Sabha. Rajya Sabha takes up discussion on demands for grants of the Ministry of Railways. Meer Bhum Violence post-mortem reports show victims badly beaten before being burned. Governor calls it horrific. Mamta Banerjee meets families of victims. Supreme Court allows Centre to investigate fake claims in COVID cases, says government could only verify 5% claims in four states with high suspected fake claims. And NATO countries hold emergency meeting on Ukraine-Russia conflict. US President Joe Biden arrives in Brussels. That's all in the news today. We'll come back again tomorrow. Till then, keep watching Sunset Television. Thank you.